Well, I was born November 24th, 1994, 7.44 a.m. at Ephraim McDowell. So just right up the street. Uh, I suffered a brachial plexus injury at birth causing limited function in my left arm due to nerve damage. And it happened because the doctor um, wanted to get to South Carolina for Thanksgiving dinner. And, you know, he had a flight he had to catch. My mom is, you know, she's this big. And obviously I'm very broad shouldered. And if they were even, I'd probably have to wear three X shirts for them to be skin tight. So instead of doing a C-section, I was stuck on my mom's tailbone. So like, instead of doing that C-section, he just stuck his foot right on the bed, grabbed me by my little baby head and just yanked me out toward the nerves in my spinal column and stuff. So just really limited the function. I was born without a pulse. They had to resuscitate me. Uh, yeah, it was a, it was a mess. My mom's got permanent tailbone damage. She said I've been a pain in her ass ever since. So you know, I call it my lucky fin after Nemo uh, came out. I've, Nemo, got, huh? I've got my lucky fin tattoo and my uh, clownfish scales and then carry around a Nemo backpack. All the kids when I was teaching thought it was so cool. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so that was kind of the, the story of my birth. Played basketball, played football, played baseball. I didn't start wrestling until I got to middle school. Uh, because I got cut from the from the middle school team, uh, so through shot put and discus okay. when I got to high school, but elementary school was just football, baseball, basketball, and a little soccer early on. But uh, when those burps, we got cut. Oh, yeah, um, <laughs> yeah um, Lincoln County had a pee wee league that you could start in the second, first or second grade. Mm -hmm. And Danville didn't have one until you got to like fourth or fifth grade. So a lot of us went over there, me, Mike, Tristan, Will Dunn, uh, just to name a few, all played in that same league. So I went over there and, you know, from then on, I played football all the way through high school and almost played in college, but the, the wrestling money was a little better. Yeah, I'm a yeah big comic book guy. Um, actually, if you lift that up, you can see like I was collecting hard copies there for a while, and actually one of my prized possessions, I got a Batman number one, New Fifty Two. So it's not like the uh, million dollar sure. copy or anything, but yeah, I, I mean it it gets up in price depending on where you look. It's black representation in comic books. Yeah, you got Storm. You've got Black Panther, you've got Jon Stewart, Green Lantern, you've got actually Simon Bass, Green Lantern. Uh, also, he's new though. Miles Morales, Spider-Man. You've got, uh, uh, I forgot his like real name or whatever, but there's a black Superman on Earth 2 who was the president of the United States. Uh, you've got, Power Man, you mentioned yeah, 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 Power Man, Luke Cage, uh, uh, who am I? Static Shock. Yeah. Static Shock was a big one when I was growing up. Uh, just the cartoon, and it tied in just from the same people as the uh, animated universe I was talking about with Batman, voiced by Kevin Conroy, bringing it, bringing it all full circle. And actually, they brought him back for when they went to the future, and John Stewart, at his like prime age, met his son. Uh, Warhawk at his prime age so like just bring it all back together like this was a big huge part of my childhood yeah. but like just seeing that you know I think now speaking of uh, Anthony Mackie's character uh, Falcon oh, yeah, in yeah, the yeah. Avengers yeah so having all that now because we kept America now right yeah, yeah. yeah. which happened in the comic books yeah. too so just have like having all that for kids growing up now like you don't have to be Superman and Batman and all that unless you want to I think Stan Lee he did a lot of that too he was pretty yeah. uh, progressive mm -hmm. for his time in the yeah. 50s and 60s well the X-Men are like a metaphor for racism yeah, I guess you're right. yeah, yeah. and uh, Professor X is based off of Martin Luther King Jr. and Magneto is based off of Malcolm X and it's the two ideologies about um, social injustice. 
Really? Yeah. And it's like people don't didn't realize it when they were reading it at first. It's like, oh, why are we treating mutants different? They're just like everybody else. They just, you know, something in their cells makes them slightly different than everybody else. Yeah, a lot of comic books, a lot of video games. I don't know. I was in that weird, like I was an athletic nerd, yeah. right? But then I got real into hip hop, rap music, uh, but not. I don't know how to explain it. Not your radio play mm-hmm. rap music. Um, so it started off, you know, when I was in elementary, middle, high, high school. You know, we were listening to, you know, Soldier Boy and doing all the dances and nothing with deep lyrics. Uh, but then, you know, my parents uh, pretty much just let me listen to whatever I wanted to, but kind of just let me know, hey, you know, this and this is the historical context with it. So I was listening to N.W.A. and Tupac and Biggie and stuff like that. And then once I got to college, um, because I was an English major, I had to take a creative writing class. And I, my teacher was like, hey, you know, write us a poem about some baggage. And I was like, okay, can you be more specific? Yeah. Uh, I got a lot going on right now. I got my two foot long blood clot. You know, my girlfriend at the time just shattered my heart to pieces. Family dying left and right. Friends dying left and right. So I had a lot of stuff for me personally, going on, going from the guy, oh, Elliot can do anything with one arm, to life just repeatedly just kicking me in the balls. Yeah, yeah, just yeah. So from there, I was like, okay, you know, I'm going to write a poem. And the first thing I wrote was like, I was trying to be like some Wordsworth and, you know, mm-hmm. doing all that stuff. And I was like, man, I don't like, like, I'm not, I don't feel connected to what I just wrote. Yeah. So I remember... Julie Dexter, you know, Julie Dexter, Mark Dexter, Julie Dexter. Okay, so in middle school, she let me, like, we had to recite a poem in front of the class, and I did Dear Mama, because um, my mom was like, well, you know, hip-hop is poetry, too. Just listen to Tupac. Yeah. And I was like, okay. So I took that kind of mindset and started listening to instrumentals. I was like, I'm going to just write some rhymes and turn it in. So I turned it in. My teacher was like, yo, yeah, you know, this is really good. But, you know, I can see like you're going with a certain rhythm, but the rhythm is off. Like, what's up with that? I was like, well, you know, I took the cuss words out because, you know, I'm teaching or not teaching. I'm, you know, like at school, he's like, hmm, put them back in and resubmit it. I was like, all right. So I did. And that ended up being the first song that I put out and released because we did like a peer review and everybody was like, oh, you should record this and do it. And I was like, "Okay, yeah. And then I paid way too much money for somebody to make it not sound too good. But (laughs) then I started doing everything myself just with YouTube and figuring out. That's why I've got the Logic program. So we started doing that in the dorm rooms. And this room, like the lights covered up. I've got kind of like a casino mentality. If you can't see the light, you don't know what time it is. (laughs) Right. So I'll just put on a pot of coffee. I think the latest I've stayed up doing music is like 8 a.m., yeah, but recently, you know, with the dad life, yeah. it's not been the easiest. But now that we've got like this split up, anytime I don't have him, I'm in here and just making music, and it uh, it's been it's it's been a journey. Well, since that's for sure. Up, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, tell us a little about him. Yeah, he's awesome, man. Um, just turned one. Uh, walking now. Yeah. Um. Uh, not necessarily talking, but he will be vocal when he wants something or knows something or knows something's up. Um, so you you kind of get a get an idea of what he's trying to say. Uh, is like one of his favorite things that he'll say. Or um, my oh, when he's throwing a fit, like he's not crying, but he's like mad about something. He'll mm, mm, mm. That, that's one of my new favorite things that he does. Uh, but yeah, loves being outside, loves the pool. Um, PJ Masks. That's his oh, jam. Yeah. yeah, just watching all the kid cartoons. I, I try to put on ones that I like too. So, yeah. you know, my top favorites. My top favorites. Not his. <laughs> mine. Uh, PJ Masks. Vampirina. Okay. Uh, Mickey Mouse Clubhouse. Uh, <laughs> yeah, all those. If it's got a catchy theme song, that's the only part that he really pays attention to. Yeah. After that, you know, he's playing with his toys or, uh, you know, trying to get into something or whatever and I'm over here 
just watching like, you know, what what are Catboy and Owlette and Gecko gonna do when Romeo takes over the city again? Like I, I gotta know like yeah, like what like what's going on here? Uh yeah, he's he's funny. He's funny. He wrestles, hopefully. Fingers crossed. Uh he's weird strong for a one year old. Uh but you know, I'm not gonna like push it on him or anything, but I'll be like, hey, you know, do you wanna play basketball or wrestle like dad? Yeah, yeah. You know, just kind of phrase it like that. But if he doesn't want to, that's, I mean, that's his choice. Sure, yeah, yeah I, I just want him to be happy. So whatever that means, if I can make sure he feels, obviously, you know, your kids feel pain. But if he can feel as little pain and as little struggle as possible, that's kind of what I want to do for him. Well, I would say first time that I can really think of is my, like my parents always tried to give me a strong biracial identity. So I wasn't black, I wasn't white, I was both. So they really brought us up to know, hey, this is where you are as far as life. These are the challenges that you could possibly face so whenever slavery was brought up, Madison had been born at this point. They explained to me that because I was light skinned, I would be in the house and they would have to work in the fields. And that crushed me. Like I had never been more devastated. I was like, no, they can't be out in the fields getting whipped and picking cotton. Like I, I should be out there or they should be in there with me. And then, or, you know, we shouldn't be slaves. Right. Um, but yeah, that was one of the first ones. And I think that was pre elementary school gotcha. and then I'd say I was in the second grade first time I got called the n-word but yeah I was like oh I can't believe you called me that what is wrong with you I went and told on them and everything yeah. uh then I talked to my parents and they kind of explained to me what I just said um so that one was an eye-opener for me like okay well maybe this word isn't necessarily a bad word unless certain people say it I remember in middle school, there was this kid going around calling all of us the N-word, and I, big mistake, obviously, because by the time I was in middle school, I was five, seven, 200 pounds, one of the biggest kids in class, and then all of my friends were about that size, too. So, I mean, just, do you know what the back of bait looks like? Just that whole grassy area, just a mob, just chasing this one kid around. And then after that, you know, teacher stopped us, but yeah, it probably wouldn't have been. Say it again? No, not not that I know of, but he also moved away. So okay. yeah. Um let's see, that's middle school, high school. Um got a lot more of it in high school. Uh just a lot of the same kind of energy brought with it. So you kinda knew, hey, I probably shouldn't say this around certain people once you got to that point. But uh, there was a guy that moved in uh, from Garrett County, okay. and he uh, started going around calling us the N-word because like a black guy was dating his ex-girlfriend or she left him for a black guy and stuff. And we all drove up to his house. And he didn't say much after that. Yeah. 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 Um, and like he was somebody that I thought was my friend before too, but then he kind of just really switched up after that. Yeah. And then, you know, after that we kind of just avoided each other and he didn't didn't speak to me, I didn't speak to him. Well, college got a lot more of it really? because I was in Adair County, Kentucky. Okay. So, so were you more of a, were you, were you a minority in college or not? I don't know much about Lindsey Wilson. Lindsey Wilson, um, on campus, you know, yeah, it's just like Danville, I, I'd say. Okay. You know, um, pretty much all the athletes are black. Mm -hmm. um, well, you know, football, basketball. Yeah. That's not where the comments came from. The comments came from, well, I dated a white girl in college. Uh, and whenever it was time for me to meet her parents, we were at a volleyball game, and I, you know, went to shake his hand. I was like, "Hi, Elliot," and I was just like, 
and he just gave me a dirty look, didn't stick his hand out. And then from there, I was just kind of like there had always been tension between like the family and me. Uh, I I just kind of picked up on it. Yeah, same thing. Big clue right there. Yeah, yeah, and that was light. I talked to her later about it. She was like, "Yeah, you know, like my dad's not in the clan or anything, but you know, he's got some friends that are in the clan." I was like, "Oh, good to know." And then told my mom, she's like, oh, I had a dream of you hanging from the dorm room roof uh, because they went and got you because you were dating a white girl. And I was like, wow, okay, thanks for, you know, putting that image in my head. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Yeah. But after that, I kind of realized how some of the people around there were. But, I mean, there's obviously great people that live there, too. But it was... I don't know. You know, you see, you see some good old boys with the big old rebel flag in the back of their window. You know, you, you lock your doors. You already know what you're getting. Yeah. Yeah. Keep your head down. Uh, just to avoid an incident. Just because I didn't really know how, like, that would happen. If I were to react negatively in that situation, me being a black man in Adair County, Kentucky, like, what a what do I do with that? Doing the education program, I like we do like a read across a dare thing, and I go in, I dress up as Batman. I have a really expensive Batman costume, <laughs> but I go in, I dress up as Batman, take pictures with the kids, read to them, all that stuff, and you know, I just give it off. Oh, Batman! Yeah, where's your card? Like it's outside. I show my ch- my uh, black Challenger. Oh yeah, yeah. At the time, like before I got the new one, the like, oh my god, it's the Batmobile! Oh. <laughs> right. So like I. They'd be like, oh, use a gadget. And I'm like, no, we can't use the gadgets indoors. There's no bad guys. All right, I'm like, do a flip. But like at that time, I could do like backflips and stuff. So I'd just do a little cartwheel in my Batman outfit. Oh, oh, they were like, oh, cool. He did it with one hand, not noticing, you know, yeah. the arm, right? But I was giving out high fives going around. And this little kid looked me dead in my eyes and said, I don't shake hands with black man. And then ran away. And then I was like, what? And then came back like with his mom and his mom was like what did you say and he was like i don't shake hands with black man and she was like oh okay and walked off just real nonchalant about it so a whole nother generation yeah yeah that's that's what kind of got me just because like i know it's a learned behavior and just i mean these are elementary school kids if that's what you're letting them do now like what else is going on if you said that in public to you Mm -hmm. What's mom saying at home in private? Exactly. Ten times worse, I'm sure. Yeah. I think it's a Will Smith quote. I'm not for sure. But he said, you know, racism and police brutality aren't gone. Or, like, it's not a new thing. It's just being recorded now. Um, But, I mean, obviously, you know, I think it's terrible. Um, I'm kind of scared, too, honestly. Uh, I would be, too. Now... I, I can think of several times where I haven't been doing anything wrong. I was on Main Street, um, headed towards East Main, and there was a police officer behind me, and the lights came on, and just an immediate adrenaline rush. Mm-hmm. Knowing I came to a complete stop, I wasn't doing anything wrong, I didn't even have my phone out. I, sh- I feel like I shouldn't feel that way, especially in my hometown. With everything that was going on with the protests and then how they started going just sideways. You know, I live on 2nd Street and it was right up the street. I was scared to walk out my door before I went. I cried, like big balling boohoo cried. And I don't want my son to feel that way. And like when I learned how to drive, my parents had to sit down and have a conversation with me. This is how you need to do, you need to move slowly. And all my friends used to make fun of me when I would, like, take my snap back off real quick, when, like, if I were to get pulled over. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, I just wanted to present myself as one of those nice Negroes that wasn't dangerous. Because if you look at all the rap videos, everybody's wearing snapbacks and gold chains and stuff. So if I had a necklace on or whatever, I'm not really a big jewelry guy. But I'd take my hat, sit here like this, speak very calmly, and I'm just talk like this. Mm-hmm. All right, officer, I'm about to grab my wallet out of the center console. There is not a weapon there. And that's how you have to do it. Unfortunately, yeah. Change can't happen unless you fix yourself first. 
regardless of if it's a racial situation, anything that you want to change, you need to look inside yourself. Okay, what about this do I personally not, not like? Whether it's something about yourself, something about your environment, and then you make that change, and then you can start changing other people. Yeah, yeah. So you, it's got a almost ripple effect. <laughs> Scrolling through like a thread of people arguing about all the social injustice, then you see stuff like, oh, well, you know, more white people are killed by the cops than black people. I understand that. That's not the point. But if you have 500 white people and 50 black people and 40 black people are getting killed and 40 white people are getting killed. Balances the, uh, yeah. Right. The well, even, even 100 white people in that. Yeah. Like, like, obviously there are some discrepancies with the numbers and people, I don't know, I feel like they're trying to almost unsee it and change the narrative to what it's not. Yeah. And I've never understood that. I don't think the police should kill anybody. College. Um, I actually wrote a song about this too. Um, I... W- had just moved into my apartment and my dad was helping me move in and my roommate at the time who looked like a young Wesley Snipes, right? So, I mean, just to give you that image, uh, Major League Wesley Snipes. That, okay. That's how I always better, imagine him. Yeah. Uh, so, we move one load, come back the next day and the yard is no trespassing signs in our neighbor's yard. I was like, okay, whatever. And then I was driving a Challenger at the time, and we'd have people over. We're college students. We were the only wrestlers that lived off campus at the time. We'd all just hang out and, you know, drink a few beers, cook out, whatever. Um, But they they would complain to our landlords, oh, there's people in and out all the time. Uh, You know, how did did he pay for that car? You know, I mean, that's that's the the lucky fan money, you know. But um, that's not what they thought. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, and then they, I saw cops circling the block several times, um, and then one time I saw the neighbor outside. I was just got back from class. I'm standing there, and I'm, he's looking at me, and I'm looking at him, and it was just kind of like a stare down almost, and I was just like, and that's all he did to me, and then never spoke. But just knowing that my presence makes someone that uneasy without knowing me. But I don't know, like, as far as, like, my extreme views of Christianity, too, like, I know that that's part of the systemic racism in the United States, too, because just forcing the religion on people instead of saying, like, hey, this is what I do. It helps me. Would you like to try it? It was forced and trying to get them to get rid of their own heritage, whether it was Native Americans or the African slaves brought in. Um, and it was almost used to reinforce the ideas, hey, because of this book right here, I can do whatever I want. So, which is not how it's supposed to be used because I grew up going to church. Like I went to St. Peter and Paul okay. when I was little. And then I've gone to church. I went to a church uh, in Columbia and there was a pastor. His name was Neil, uh, Neil, Neil James is his name. And saved my life, right? But he was doing it the right way. Yeah. You know, like he wasn't, like I didn't feel forced. We would have conversations and it was very uplifting. So I feel like any religion that's used in that way can't be bad. Have you ever had a desire to be in politics? Um, yes and no. Um, I have, uh, Mr. Atkins the other day was telling me, Hey, you know, the old guard is leaving what we need young, fresh faces. This might be something you want to look into. And I started to seriously consider it then. Um, but I'd always joke, all right, Porter 2032. All right. Cause that's when I'll be old enough to be the president. And I don't know, it might be narcissistic of me to think that. You know, if everybody listened to me, the world would be a better place. But I, I've thought that since I was three. Sure, yeah. Uh, just because I feel like I would have everybody's best interest at heart. But that's part of the problem is 
like I would try to please everybody, probably. But also I feel like I could make the hard decisions if I had to. The thing with that is going in with that platform, not a lot of people are gonna like that. So social issues are more important to me than economics. Yeah. Uh, because if like really all you're valuing is money instead of human lives, there's something wrong with the system. But I feel like once everybody else is taken care of, then we can start worrying about making money. I was having a conversation with one of my friends in here just the other day, and he was saying like that all of the kind of progress we made with Obama, Trump is kind of undone. And I mean, I definitely see where he's coming from because having a black president really forced those hard questions and those hard conversations. And these are his words, not mine, but I, I just happen to agree. And then now, if you look back through history, kind of the code words that politicians use to kind of prey on the lower socioeconomic areas of rural white people, you can kind of rile them up by using certain words and that gets people going, oh yeah, I'm gonna vote for you, build the wall. Yeah, so like if you're calling Mexican people rapists and killers, I mean, that's racist. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Calling black people thugs. I mean, I said that in the song I wrote. Like, they can't call us niggas anymore without being booted out of office mm -hmm. or not getting reelected. But you can hear, um, I think it was Nixon's campaign manager and, like, one of the something that was recorded then. Yeah, it came out recently, didn't it? Uh, yeah. Have you seen the documentary 13th? No. That's on Netflix. That's something you need to watch, too. Uh, but if you watch that, you can just hear, like, oh, well, we can't say this, so we need to think of something else to come up with that, so that we can say this. And, like, with, with conveying the same message, just different words. So, just as far as politics, like, I know, like, it, it, it's a broken system. Yeah. And it always has been. So, like, at this point especially, it's taken the lesser of evils. And, but I think there should be hope and somebody positive in that's actually trying to make change and actually trying to do something good for people instead of being the lesser of evil. The protests and seeing the contrast between the way people are treated yeah. based off of what they're protesting, like talk about, oh, I wanna get back to work, I want a haircut, I wanna to go to the movies, I wanna to go to a restaurant, and they're standing there with assault rifles and the police are just wearing normal gear. Yeah, yeah. And then stop killing black people. You're in yeah, riot thanks. gears. <laughs> to, have you seen where the, uh, he was trying to get like 10,000 people or 10,000 armed forces in front of the White House? Yeah. yeah. Like, that's insane. You kind of look at it like not all Trump supporters are racist, but all racists are Trump supporters. Yeah, I give you that, yeah. yeah. Like, you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So... And then, honestly, the red hat is the new white hood. Well, I appreciate you doing this. Well, tonight. not a problem. I'm glad I did it. Yeah. Uh, I'm a little nervous, though, being number one. Just, uh, I hope so. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks for having me. It was sex toy that looked like hair roll. Last time I'll blow up. Bangle, ooh, ooh, bangle. Target, keep my bangle, ooh.